for your testimony. Jim Hoffman, Hoffman Construction, and Terry Hayden, Wisconsin Pipe Trades. Speaking against, followed by F. Vincent Renuncio, Director of Labor Policy at the Mackinac Center for Public Policy. Speaking in favor. Mr. Chairman, member of the committee, greetings. My name is James Hoffman, president of Hoffman Construction Company, located in Black River Falls, Wisconsin. I'm here today to testify against Senate Bill 44, the right to work legislation. Listening to some of the earlier testimony, I understand that uh, you're talking about me. You're talking about a guy out there with a construction company trying to hire people, grow the company, invest in equipment, and grow the economy. So I appreciate all the concern over my company. We have a simple motto in our company. Our company is our people. We specialize in heavy civil road construction, including many DOT projects, some of which right here in Madison, the Verona Road Project, and also out on the Beltline. I represent the fourth generation of Huffman Construction. My great-grandfather started the company 100 years ago this year, in 1915 rebuilding a section of Elma Center Road, or actually constructing it, not rebuilding it, hadn't been built yet, in Jackson County. And amazingly, our company has fifth generation workers, all members of the Operating Engineers Union. Our company has had a long relationship with the Operating Engineers Local 139. We are part of a multi-employer agreement with the Operating Engineers, which provides our company with highly skilled, safe, and trained workers, which we rely on to build projects cost effectively. We can count on their productivity in developing our bids to the DOT. Also, we do work out of state, bringing many of our Wisconsin operating engineers with us due to their skill and their availability. Right to work will create tension amongst our employees, those paying dues and those not. We work as a team, and this will be an unproductive distraction for our company. In addition, Pursuant to federal law, unions are prohibited from negotiating different wages, hours, or other terms and conditions of employment for employees within a bargaining unit based on the employee's union membership status. Employers who insist on such a proposal would be violating federal law for bargaining in bad faith. So those that are represented by the union and those that are not, I cannot have a two-tier pay system Otherwise, I would be negotiating in bad faith with the union. As such, right to work will not produce any cost savings to my company. I will not be able to pass on any of those savings to the DOT in future bids. The legislation as proposed will, over time, interfere with my company's ability to have this ready, willing, and able pool of, worker, of highly trained workers. By withholding union dues that are needed to administer the contract, it will drain the union's ability to supply those trained, highly skilled workers for me to grow. I'd like to share with you a job story, my company's job story. Last year, our company grew over 50%. We used the operating engineer's hiring hall to hire over 200 new employees to our company. Those employees were needed to grow our company. We invested in new equipment, and we were able to bid competitively because we knew that the operating engineers had skilled and trained workers available to staff our equipment. Without the operators supplying us with those new hires, we would not be able to have sourced all those new employees. In our company's negotiation with the union, each year we agree upon a pay scale for the total package, wages, training, and fringe benefits. The union and their members, not the employer, decide how to allocate that raise each year how much goes into wages, how much goes into fringe benefit, how much goes into the skill improvement fund, how much goes into the central pension fund, and also the operating engineer's health fund. If the funding does not go into training, it would end up as wages. Let me repeat that. If the funding increase, an annual increase, did not go into wages, it would, excuse me, into the uh, training, it would end up as wages. If the wages don't go into training, the money goes into our employee's paycheck. It's their money, not mine. And by the way, that's with no government subsidy in that training. It's important to say this over and over because of the misinformation that's floating around repeatedly by WMC. They're trying to confuse you with the issue on how it actually works. 
Even Senator Fitzgerald had it wrong. For example, I have with me, and I believe I provided copies for the, for the uh, um, committee, the uh, annual allocation for 2013 to the Wisconsin Operating Engineers um, Health Heavy Highway Agreement. If you see, there was a $2 raise that the Employers Council and the union negotiated. The union had exclusive rights to allocate those dollars across the board, wherever they see their members needed service. Did they need it in the wage? Did they need it in the skill improvement? Did they want to allocate it toward the pension? If you look at 2013, of the $2 raise, 40 cents per hour was applied to the central pension fund. <clears throat> Five cents went to the skill improvement and apprenticeship fund. Five cents would be applied to the joint labor management work preservation fund. And $1.50 went to the wage. I'm not sure why a business organization such as WMC would intentionally mislead the public on a business-related allocation like this. It kind of reminds me of the President Obama when he said, if you own a business, you didn't build that. In this case, WMC is trying to say, if you use your own wages for training, you didn't do that, the business did. Well, of course, the business, my, the company, pays for the wages, pays for the training, pays for all the other thing, but they get to allocate it. I'm a fourth generation business owner. Take it from me, the money for training comes from the employee's wages, period. With respect to the pension and healthcare, monies are allocated to these by the union and they are managed by a joint board of contractors and union members. So the health care fund, the skill improvement fund, and the central pension fund are both, are both have equal members on either side of the table. Those members allocate the monies that are allocated to them on an annual basis, each coming up into agreement on how to allocate it to the health care pension. And again, let me remind you, with no government subsidies. The downturn in the economy in 2009 put a squeeze on the assumed rate of return that the pension had in it, which created an unfunded liability back to the member contractors. Federal law mandates that multi-employer pensions take steps to correct this, but it takes time, and more importantly, it takes contractor members contributing dues, contributing funds to the pension over time to correct it. If the right to work legislation passes and union contractors close up shop due to a lack of access to skilled workers, the pension liability for those companies that close its shop would be reallocated to those members still standing. It's a last man standing philosophy under the federal ERISA law. For instance, if contractor A has an unfunded liability of $5 million and closes up shop, that liability would be distributed to the rest of the union contractor members. Right to work states have shown to lose union members and lose union contractors over time. This will pass the unfunded liability to those contractors still in business. I ask you, why are you doing this to my company? Why are you passing on this liability? I want to remain around here for more generations. We've been here 100 years. I want to make it 200. Why are you doing this? There will be no savings in right to work that the state will see. Good paying construction jobs will get replaced with minimum wage jobs. Definitely not in the state's interest. This legislation and the talk of repeal of prevailing wage statutes will be a steady decline of skilled, trained workers who earn a living wage and along with it, family owned companies, construction companies such as mine, small businesses who depend on their workers for productivity. Rather than interfere with my company's ability to have access to skilled workers, you should instead concentrate on how to convince me to grow my business, how to hire more workers, like I did last year. Because of the proposed right to work legislation and proposed prevailing wage repeal, our company has canceled plans to invest in new equipment and to hire new people for this year. We don't see a certainty in the, in the, in the future out there for a union contractor. And speaking of freedom, what about my freedom? What about my freedom as a small business owner to associate with the union contractor, with a union that represents my workers and represents me and provides me with productive people? What about my freedom in a, in a democracy and in a capitalist society? By the way, I have to apologize. I didn't do any regression analysis today. I didn't do any push polls. 
I don't have any slides to show, but what I have is a passion. I have a passion for my company and my workers. And with all due respect, please do not repeal right to work. Thank you for your time, and I can answer any questions. Senator, Senator Warch. For once, I don't have much to say. Thank you for what you do. Thank you for the wonderful relationship you have with your employees. I applaud you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Any other questions? Senator Larson. That's my mic. There we go. Um, thank you for coming and sharing your story. Where, where did you say it was from again? We're from Black River Falls, Wisconsin, but we perform work throughout Wisconsin and Minnesota. Okay. We're so currently you working here in Madison, Green Bay, um, over in the Minnesota market also. Yeah, and I was trying to keep track of the numbers. of You said you were around for 100 years. How many workers? Right now we have over 350 workers. Wow. We hired 200 new workers last year when wow. we grew our business 50%. That's huge. It was That's a very, uh, very big growth year for us. Um, what that's and that's huge. Congratulations to that. As you project moving forward, um, what do you think RTW will do? You said you've already scaled back on purchasing the equipment. Uh, uh, use other states in comparison. Oklahoma. Okay. Alabama. Mississippi. So, so the workers that you just hired. Um, I mean, are, are, if this goes through, will you still be able to, 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 to keep that or will you still be able to stay on that in, trajectory in and term. keep hiring folks? In the short term, we will. But over time, as we've seen in other states, um, certain union members will opt out of paying their dues. And that will, over time, erode the union's ability to administer the contract that they have with us. We have a lot of items in common. Yeah. We have uh, um, being able to provide a workforce being able to have safety um, legislation that we share in common. So we have a lot of things in common that we need to work together to both protect our business and to protect the interest of our employees through their union representation. Gotcha. Okay. So you're, it, it sounds like, just to summarize, you're, you're kind of, you know, that, that huge growth you saw in the last year, you're kind of having to pause and see what's going to end up happening after this. It's throwing uncertainty a when lot I of buy uncertainty. A new bulldozer. That bulldozer is going to be expected to last for 10 years. I'll put probably 17,000 hours on that machine before I trade it in. Those are all union work hours. Yeah. I'm not going to do that right now because I don't have the certainty on right to work and I don't have the certainty on uh, prevailing wage and the budget for all that matters. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. I appreciate you coming all the way from uh, Black River Falls for Thank us. You. Thanks. I have just one question. You know, you. Uh, Talk about the fact that uh, if right to work comes, that uh, there's not going to be as much effectiveness in training and, and that that area of of what the union provides. But you're saying that it's it's really good for you as a business owner to have those trained individuals that are going to get a spot in your company when you're doing your your contracting. Um, are you saying that right to work is going to cause these the members of the union that are getting this great value to say, I'm not going to accept that great value anymore? It's not part of the, uh, the dues. The dues don't go toward the training. The employees part of the wage goes toward their training. What will happen that we've seen from other states is that some of the members may opt out of paying their dues. Once they do that, it's a slow erosion on the union's ability to administer the contract that I, uh, I live and die by. We don't have any seniority rules. So the ability over time for the union to represent its workers and my interests that we have in common will be eroded. So you're saying salaries for the business agents, basically? No, it would be uh, the ability to come and, and talk to the legislature on different legislation that's in front of them, advocate for uh, a strong transportation budget. Um, we have a lot of other things in common also. What would stop you from doing that, though? I mean, you can still come and talk to your legislatures at, at any time. I do. And I, I would hope that you, you do that because I think that's important to us. But this right, right to work doesn't say that you can't form a union nor maintain a union. It actually protects that union person that if they're going to be there, that you as the employer can't say you can't be a member of the union. Uh, they, you'd be in violation of the right to work law. We see what happens in other states. And what happens is that there's a slow erosion in the members that choose to pay dues 
because of economic conditions and other, other factors. And as a result, I see a slow erosion in the union's ability to provide those skilled workers for me to go ahead and grow my company. I'm a risk taker. As a small business owner, I take risks every day. One of those risks is should I buy that machine or should I wait? And right now you're telling me I should wait. And that is not by the government that I want to represent me. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Mr. Hayden. Okay, thank you. Am I on? You're on. All right. Uh, thank you, Chairman.